There's a few things I want to just go back to from last week on uh, the meaning of assurance. So let's do a quick review here. We, we said that there's two senses in which we could talk about assurance. So there's two ways of defining it. Anybody remember what the two ways were? Anybody? Okay, good. Assurance of the gospel. And that's the assurance that God's promises are true. Just what God says in his word, taking him at his word. And what we said was that that kind of assurance, that definition of assurance, is indeed um, essential to saving faith. It's of the essence of saving faith, as we'll talk about here in just a minute. Okay? If you don't believe his promise is true, how could you believe the gospel, right? So, in that sense, assurance is essential, integral to faith. But there's another sense in which we can talk about assurance, and that's assurance of my interest in the gospel. Assurance of my own salvation, right? One of them says, um, Jesus saved sinners, and the other says, Jesus saved Brett, right? The, the, applying that personally uh, to ourselves and my own salvation. <clears throat> um, and that's not essential to saving faith. I think we can have doubts about that and not have a level of assurance as we're going to define it here in a minute. So not of the essence of faith, uh, but the first one is. Okay. So let me show you where that debate shows up in Reformed Confessions. Can everybody see that? All right. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Yeah, if I took these off, I, I don't even see the board. So... Um, so first of all, let's just take a look at this. So this is the Westminster Confession, and there's a, some catechism questions that go along with it, but I'm just using the Confession. And over here, this is um, the three forms of unity. Does anyone know what the three forms of unity are, by the way? Matt! <laughs> yeah, it's the three separate confessions written by the Continental Brethren. Yes. That uh, the Dutch Reformed German Reformed was Reformed in those years rather than the Westminster. Correct. They were written in a better, better language. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that was actually what we started with over here, and uh, we eventually moved to this one. But we still love this one, so we're going to look at both of them today. <clears throat> so uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, the Belgian Confession, and what are called the Canons of Dort, okay, are just these different confessions that are used by the broader Reformed Church. Okay, and we have our Westminster Confession and so forth. So just I want you just to kind of look up here, those of you who can see it, and um, tell me what words... Do these confessions use to define assurance? What, what words, phrases, expressions are they using to talk about this kind of assurance that we're talking about? Alea. Faith. Faith? Okay, good. What else do we see? What words here describe this assurance? Infallible. Good, you see that? Um, infallible assurance, okay? Infallible assurance. Good. What else? What? Somebody said it. Knowledge. Knowledge. Okay, good. Oh, sure knowledge. Yeah, sure knowledge. See that? Sure knowledge. What, what kind of parallel over here do you see for sure knowledge? Certainty, good. Uh, not bare conjecture or a, a, a mere probable persuasion. You see the words that are being used there. Sure knowledge. Uh, over here we got uh, firm confidence, um, assured confidence, peace of conscience. Right? So, so how do these confessions differ on whether assurance is what we call of the essence of faith. Now, here's what we mean by that. We mean by essence of faith that you cannot be a Christian without it. The essence of, of true and saving faith means if this is not present, you don't have saving faith. Do you think they differ at all on that question? Well, let's start with the Westminster. What does the Westminster say over on this side? Is this kind of assurance essential to saving faith? Where do you see it? In the 
There it is. Yeah. You can't be a true believer and, and not have an infallible assurance. Do you see that? Really plainly stated there. This, this kind of an, an assurance, this as we just defined it here, that infallible assurance does not belong to the essence of faith. It is not a necessary condition for being saved, for having genuine saving faith. That's really clear here in the Westminster, isn't it? What do you think is the position of the three forms of unity? Well, let's look at it. So, Heidelberg 21, what is true faith? Okay, there's nobody who gets saved without true faith. And so, a lot of people look at this and say, well, look, look at that definition of, of true saving faith. True faith is a sure knowledge. Hmm whereby I accept as true all that God has revealed to us in his word, and at the same time, it is a firm confidence that not only to others, okay, not only Jesus saves sinners, but also to me, God has granted forgiveness, everlasting life, and so forth. See that? And the Canons of Dort in uh, section 1, article 16, says that faith is... An assured confidence. And it's defining saving faith here. And again, in uh, uh, section 5, article, 9, article 19, no, that's article 9. If I can't see it from right here, you guys have no chance. I'm sorry about this. But um, notice, faith is, um, is an assurance. It is a certain persuasion, right, that all Christians have. And so some people have read this and said, well, it sounds like, these confessions teach that assurance is absolutely necessary in order to be a Christian. Whereas the Westminster comes along and says, no, it's not. It's important, but it's not. I'm not so sure that that's true. I don't necessarily think they are saying different things. I think both of these are trying to say the same thing. And they're, I think they're just struggling to strike the balance. And let me show you why I think that. Let's first start with um, the Westminster. So it, it calls assurance uh, certain and fallible. You see that? But then what happens down here? How does it begin talking about assurance down in this section? Look what it says. It says, true believers may have the assurance of their salvation shaken in diverse ways, diminished, um, intermittent. So it can, it can rise and fall. It sounds like it can be lost. And these are the various ways in which we can, you know, that, that can happen. But isn't that an interesting way to talk about an infallible certain assurance. In, in what sense is it infallible if it can be lost? Infallible if it can be shaken and diminished and intermittent? What do they mean by that? I mean, that's what they're saying. Um, and it also says that we can never lose assurance in another sense, though, right? Because after saying all that can happen to your assurance, look at what it says. Uh, some people think that the Westminster is just all about precision in theological language, but it's also very pastoral. And this is a really pastoral section. It's saying that if you have had your assurance shaken, diminished, weakened, if you're struggling with these things, here's the wonderful promise, yet they are never utterly destitute of that seed of God and life of faith that love of Christ and the brethren, that, look at that, sincerity of heart and conscience of duty out of which the operation of the Spirit, out of which by the operation of the Spirit, this assurance may be in due season revived. So it's saying in a sense like that assurance never gets lost. Right? God never leaves you without these, these things here. And certainly when he talks about sincerity of heart and, 
and conscience of duty, that's like an internal conviction and persuasion and confidence. That can't be lost, right? So something's going on here in this confession where they're trying to, to wrestle with this. Like there's a sense in which it seems like we can not have it or lose it, but then there's another sense in which we always have it and we'll never lose it. So how do you put those together? And I, I think the three forms is doing the same thing. Because after all these statements about how true and saving, genuine faith has this confidence, this assurance, and so forth, it then includes this statement, um, sometimes this faith sometimes can lose the sense of God's favor for a time. So even, even the continental tradition is kind of wrestling with this. It's like, man, there's a sense in which we can lose it, but there's a sense in which we never lose it. There's a sense in which it's, it's got to be integral to what it means to be a Christian, but there's, an, there's another sense in which it doesn't seem to be. Okay? And I think what these confessions are trying to do is to, to, to trying to hold in balance the, the biblical balance on faith and assurance. Okay? Are they always clear? And we just read it. I don't, I don't, I, I, that, there's, some, there's some lack of clarity here. And, and I think that's just owing to the fact that you've got a lot of people working together trying to put together some, some difficult um, truths from God's word. And that's not being critical of these confessions. It's just recognizing that we have limits. And I'm not here coming to you as a, as a guy who's read this for a while. Like, well, I figured out what none of those guys could figure out. And I'm going to tell you what the real, like, just read the history of it. Like the fact that these appear to be different shows us that there's quite a bit of back and forth, even within the Reformed Church, on how to think about these things. And if you read systematic theologies, and if you read treatises on this, you read the Puritans, you read just almost anybody on this, they all acknowledge the fact that there's a great deal of ambiguity, even what they're trying to articulate here. Okay? So I agree with those who think the confessions are, are not contradictory so much as they're, they're, they're trying to articulate two different kinds of assurance, two different senses in which we have assurance and at some points don't have assurance, okay? Now, b b before, I want to look at some texts. I want to go to the Bible now and let's see what they're saying and how we can maybe try to put these things together. But before we do that, let me just, can I just stop for a second and, and ask the question, why do you think this is even worth talking about? Because I wonder if maybe some of you are thinking that very, very question right now. Okay, yeah, Blair. I've heard some of those say that by questioning your assurance actually shows your true heart. Because oh. you are always, it's part of that humility that you, that comes from becoming a Christian. What's cool about it is that even if the question it doesn't change the fact of, of your salvation. But it, it's true, which kind of like, sounds kind of you know, based on what you're saying. It's like, well, there's nothing wrong with being introspective in my mind about where am I at with my faith. And if you and we know that just from life that people do question different things. Right. As we went through it. But I thought I found that kind of interesting that being said like that. Versus, oh, hey, I'm saved. I don't have to worry about anything, right? Right. Versus saying, well, okay. And that's where we get into the whole, I think, sanctification. What we do is important to the Lord. That's what else we're thinking is said. Yeah. So so you're saying that there's 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 a virtue in being open to a lack of assurance. There's a there's a there's a virtue in self-examination of, of perhaps at times questioning, do I, am I really in the faith? That's a form of humility. Is that what you're saying? Is that? Yeah, that's, you know, yes. That's from, from what, maybe that's, I don't know if that's all from a personal perspective as much as... Just generally. There's a lot of people who think that way. Oh, okay, yeah. Right. Good. Yeah, that's right. If you never, ever ask that question, what does that say? So 
that's one perspective, but there's another perspective amongst Christians who take the opposite end. They say, if you ever question or examine, that shows that you are not a Christian. Because what it means to be a Christian is that you should never have those kinds of doubts. See how this is really, yeah, really important stuff. Yeah, Matt. So, yeah, I, I, I see what Blair's saying is that when I was uh, a younger guy at a, at a Baptist or a Baptist church, there, there was like a, a entire uh, class of uh, uh, so like young men that were constantly questioning their salvation. Uh, and, and they were like, well, what's the point of salvation? And to the result of them being completely useless uh, for any other purpose. And, and they needed somebody to say to them that quit worrying about this. I think as Blair said, if somebody's nearly this concerned about the state of their salvation, they'll, they'll probably say, because nobody's sitting at home on a Sunday morning watching golf. Is worried about their salvation. <laughs> if you're watching golf, you are probably not going to have any If you're watching NASCAR, it's okay. <laughs> That's an excused absence on a Sunday this morning because those things happen. But yeah, I mean, they need reminded that, uh, you know, again, the, 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 the Buddhist isn't worried that, 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 that Christ may have died on earth. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and so the, this is good, but we also don't need to help people to move and, you know, find something to do to serve. Right. right. Yeah, good. So, so this, is, this is actually really important. This is very practical. Okay? We're going to see that especially as we come to the possibility of assurance here in just a second. Okay? All right. Well, look, let's look at some texts. Let me, I'm going to try to give you uh, a few things that the Bible teaches that I think helps us with this question. Okay? A lot of this we touched on last week in the sermon. So a little more uh, depth today than what we had last week. But we kind of got a, an introduction to it. Is that text any better than the red? Okay. <laughs> and that settles it. Did, are, you, uh, are you wondering about that? There was no lack of assurance. Is there any lack of assurance? <laughs> Those are, was a great deal of self examination this past week. Red, yellow, blue. Yeah. All right, so here we go. Just, this is just a number of passages that shows that faith. Saving faith, genuine faith, can increase, it can decrease, but it can never be lost. Genuine, saving faith, faith that unites us to Christ, where we have forgiveness of sins, His righteousness, everlasting life, justification, adoption, everything. Genuine, saving faith. And look, that faith can grow, it can shrink. But it can never be lost. So a few examples of this. Paul talks about God giving to each according to the measure of faith that he assigns. So ultimately, like we're looking to the Lord to be the one who gives and preserves faith. And just as some Christians might suffer more than other Christians. Some Christians might have more of the world's prosperity than other Christians. Some might be um, holier than another Christian, right? That happens according to God's plan and purpose. Uh, but, but all of them are given faith by God and preserved in their faith by God. Uh, Jesus, you know, as he's talking about anxiety, um, gives all of these illustrations to be trusting the Lord. And he says, you know, when we're anxious, many times it's because we just have little faith. Oh, ye have little faith. Um, but then he talks to the, the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15 and says that, you know, this, this woman who's um, not part of the, the Jewish heritage, uh, Syrophoenician woman, she comes in, she's wanting Jesus um, to heal her demon-possessed daughter and Remember, Jesus is like, listen, the bread goes to the children, not the dogs. And everybody thinks that, that well, what an unloving thing for Jesus to say. It's really, it's really not if you understand the context of it. But she persists, doesn't she? And, and Jesus says to her, um, not get away from me, you dog. What does he say? A woman, great is your faith. The apostles asked Jesus to increase their faith. And we've got the, the father who brings the demon-possessed boy to Jesus in Mark 9. And, uh, you know, if you can heal him. Jesus like, can? And the man's like, 
You know, Lord, I, 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 I believe that you can. I just have doubts. See that? There, I believe, but I also have unbelief. You see how they're, he's, he's using the same word. These contradictory belief and unbelief are antithetical to one another, and yet they coexist within this man in some relationship, right? And then the fact that it can't fail, we can look in a lot of passages. This is just my favorite, right? We see this massive lapse in faith with Peter. And Jesus says, Satan has demanded to have you. And I've told Satan he can't have you. That's not what he says. He's going to allow Satan to sift him like wheat. Satan comes and puts him on the rack. Three times Peter denies Jesus under the attacks of Satan. And it's not that Jesus says, I'm never going to let Satan attack you. It's that Jesus says, I've prayed for you. I'm preserving your faith. You're going to waver. You're going to deny me three times over, but you're never going to lose faith. So the first denial, Peter still has saving faith. The second denial, he still has saving faith. The third denial, three times, he stares Jesus in the faith. He says he looks at him, he denies him, and he still has saving faith. Because Jesus prayed that his faith would not fail. It can rise, it can fall, but it can never be lost. That's really, really helpful for us as we think about the nature of assurance. Okay? Second, faith involves knowing Christ. Okay? So, the Bible makes a distinction between believing something and knowing something. Okay? There's a... There's more to knowledge than there is simply to believe. You can believe false things, okay? You can believe things that turn out to be false. You can't know things that are false, though. And, and certainly, in, in a biblical understanding of knowledge, knowledge is not merely intellectual. It's also relational. Okay? Okay? So, lots of examples of this. Just here's a few. John 10, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. The object of their knowledge aren't propositions about Jesus. They have those, certainly. But it's more than propositional knowledge. There's relational knowledge. They know Jesus. They know him in a saving way. Jesus says Eternal life. You want a definition? Here it is. That they know God. And Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Okay. Paul, 2 Corinthians 4. God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So this knowledge is a necessary condition for salvation. Yeah. The, um, I can't see oh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Okay. Yeah. So there, there is a knowledge of God in Romans 1 that every human being has because they're made in God's image. He implants that knowledge immediately to them. It's, um, it cannot be eradicated, part of the image of God. It's suppressed by non-Christians, but it's never eradicated. Christians, however have been born again to a knowledge of Jesus Christ in the gospel in a saving way. Okay? It is relational, uh, but it's certainly not less than intellectual. We don't know a concept. We don't know a false Jesus. We know the true Jesus. Then we know what Jesus has truly done. We know what the gospel truly is. We can distinguish between a true gospel and a false gospel. That's bound up into our knowledge of Christ. <clears throat> but then we can also talk about assurance involving knowledge of our knowledge. So it involves knowing that we have come and continue to know Christ. 
Assurance involves knowing that we know Christ. And this has got to be, I think, the most helpful single verse for pulling together what we've been talking about of these two kinds of assurances. Because look what John does here in 1 John 2-3. Um, we're going to go into the kitchen for a minute and, and watch how the meal is prepared. Because we have to talk a little bit about the Greek words that are used here in the verb tenses. Okay? Because this is so important. John does things like this often in 1 John. He talks about, in 1 John, uh, about apostates. He says, they were of us. But then he goes, but they were never of us. And he uses the exact same Greek phrase for both. There's a sense in which they were of us. There's a sense in which they never were of us. Okay? So we're using these same words and phrases in different senses to make a point. And that's what he's doing here in 1 John 2, 3. Watch what he says here. All right. He distinguishes two kinds of knowledge using verb tenses, using conditionals, and using objects of knowledge. I'll define what I mean by those. So by this we know. What tense is that in English? Present tense. Good. And what is the object of the knowledge? What is it that we are knowing? What does he say? That we have come to know. Okay? We're knowing that we have come to know. We're knowing something about our current state of grace as a Christian. You see that? We're knowing something about ourselves. It's it's reflective in a sense. That's the object. What's the condition of that kind of knowledge? Was that a hand? I saw that go up like that. You got to be careful. Yeah, Yeah, you're right. (laughs) What's the condition? And we find conditions with words like if. Okay. Yeah, you got it? If we keep his commandments. Do you see the condition? The condition of this kind of knowledge is keeping the commandments. The object of this knowledge is our state of knowing Jesus, of being saved. Okay? And it's a present tense verb. At this moment, we know this. Now, notice how that's different than the exact same Greek word that's used in the second clause. Okay? The the words are gnosko, which means to know. We got the present tense in the first clause. What about the second clause? Is it present tense? No. In Greek, there's different ways of talking about past events. There's a simple past event that doesn't necessarily have any continuing um, application. Uh, But there's also a verb tense called the the perfect in Greek that talks about something that's taken place in the past and has ongoing results. Okay? That's the verb that's used here. It's happened in the past and it continues into the present. Do you see that? Now, we know present tense that we have in the past come to know and continue to know. You see the differences in the verbs. He's making that distinction. What's the difference in the object of knowledge? In the first use of know, what are we knowing? We're knowing something about my state of salvation. What's the object of knowledge in the second clause? Huh? Him. Him. It's Jesus. You see that? Now, it still involves us because it's saying we know Jesus, but the object of the knowledge is him. It's not merely intellectual, it's also relational. You see that? And I think in (laughs) verses like this, we have reason to make a distinction between what we would call a gospel assurance of, of knowing the gospel And what we might just call a personal assurance of of knowing that we personally are beneficiaries of the gospel. And there's different ways that theologians have talked about that distinction. There's different ways of articulating it. And I've just given you what I 
find to be the easiest way to understand it. Which will bring us back then to the definition I gave. The kind of assurance we're talking about is not the kind of assurance that is of the essence of faith, right? We're not talking about knowing the gospel. We're talking about an assurance defined as a state of being fully persuaded of my eternal salvation. A state of being fully persuaded of my eternal salvation. Okay, so it is a state, which means that state is subject to change. It's a psychological state. It can come and go. Okay? And it involves a state of being fully persuaded. And that's the key thing. The, the, the key word there is fully. What, what are the necessary conditions to be fully persuaded as as opposed to maybe partially persuaded. And I think really what we're getting at is we're not troubled by doubts. That's really the, 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 the essence of it right there. We're not beset and worried and troubled about doubts. Now, there could be any number of reasons for that. The Westminster gave several, right? It talks about sin. It talks about Satan. It talks about just God's sovereignty, so there's any number of reasons. So, sometimes people are, are not full of doubts because they're just not subjected to doubts. I think probably the vast majority of Christians throughout the world and throughout history are in this category. They've not been to university and, and heard their professors chipping away at their faith, trying to weaken their faith and stir doubts. Perhaps they're in a community that believes Christ. They, they hear the word in and out. They don't get involved in these controversies of uh, fraction groups like the Bible says don't be a part of those. They're just not exposed to them. If you don't know about a particular challenge to your faith, you're probably not going to be uh, troubled by it. Now, s- some would look at that and say, well, that's really just trying to create a, a, a naivety amongst Christians. Christians are just naive. They're just, not, they're just not, they're ignorant of what's out there. And if they just only knew, they wouldn't be Christians. Well, that's not really true either. This happens all the time when I teach on the problems of evil. I think every Christian at some point has asked that question, like, why is there so much evil in this world? But they've frequently not put that into a tight syllogism and seen uh, deductive logic creating an incompatibility in the Christian view of God in the world. So what I'll do is I will help clarify their concerns. I'll put it up on the board and I'll show them the logical problem of evil. Okay, let me just articulate your worry better than you have and show you how big of a worry it is. And then that group is like, oh, maybe we shouldn't, maybe we've, you know. And then the next thing I'll do is, is I will solve for them the logical problem they do. It's really not that difficult. Most philosophers today don't even give that a second thought. Everybody knows that that's been solved. Logically, it is not a problem as long as God has a morally sufficient reason for the evil that exists. So I show them that. And then they're like, oh, okay. Whew. Good. And then I say, but now there's another problem. They're like, oh, no. And then I show them the um, evidential problem of evil. And then I articulate that. And then I'm like rising doubts, right? I'm, I'm raising the tide of doubts in them. And then they feel uneasy. They feel troubled. And then I give them a satisfactory answer to it. And they're like, oh, okay, good. And then I come back, right? And you see what's happening, this rising and falling. Right, just because somebody doesn't have exposure to the more difficult challenges to Christianity, it also is the case that they don't have exposure to the answers to those challenges. We can always keep climbing that ladder of more difficult challenges and more difficult responses to those challenges. So I don't think we're cultivating a naive Christianity. I think it's just God's kindness in in not even exposing some Christians to the challenges that are out there that have been resolved, that are not genuine objections to Christianity in any way, shape, form, or fashion. In any case, they're not troubled at this time by doubts. 
And it's an assurance of their own interest in the gospel, not just simply of the gospel itself, but their own interest in it. And as we said, it's not just I'm saved at T1, I might not be saved at T5, right? I'm, I'm saved today on Sunday, by Wednesday I might wreck that. It's eternal salvation, it's everlasting salvation, it never ends. It's a future hope of eternity with Christ. That's what we mean by assurance here. Okay, yeah, Chris. I think that it's really good that uh, people are given the truth by a pastor that actually knows that truth and has the answer. Because there are thousands upon thousands, millions of Christians throughout the world that don't have answers Mm. for those hard questions. Right. And then... So when their faith is challenged and they get into a situation and they don't have an answer and then they feel betrayed and they feel like they were brainwashed yeah. because they, did, they weren't given all of the information. Right. And so I think it's, I mean, that's one of the things that I love about the Reformed tradition is this stuff's thought out. <laughs> right. There are answers right. there. They've thought through these things. Right. And they've got not just a logical, but a biblical response. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty powerful. I mean, that is really the truth that sets people free. Right. And, of course, the Bible commands us to be always ready to give a reasoned defense for the hope that is within us. So somehow we have to be equipped for that. That's the role of the church, certainly. Yeah. But then we also have like, well, how, how deep do you go on that? You know, and, and kind of our, our approach as a church has been, what are the most common objections that our people are going to be exposed to, right? And we try to cover those as best we can and positively train Christians to think, to think Christianly, which is not against reason. If we're thinking God's thoughts after him, we're thinking reasonably, and we want to cultivate a, a culture of, of Christian thinking that isn't afraid to face objections and has been trained on how to deal with objections. And that's a great point that Chris is making. So that's what we mean by assurance. Okay? And this is where, right back to where I ended last week, actually. Um, so we're asking the question, is it possible for Christians to have it? Okay? And that's what we'll turn to uh, next time.